Today, Cities of Migration presents Dialogue Circles, Building Intercultural Understanding Between Immigrant and Indigenous Communities. In the next hour, we will be learning about groundbreaking initiatives in Wellington, New Zealand and Vancouver, Canada that are bringing new immigrant and Indigenous communities together for intercultural learning and meaningful exchange as an essential part of newcomer settlement and the business of creating a culture of welcome within these multicultural societies. Joining us today are, from Wellington, New Zealand, Judy Altinkaya, National Manager, Settlement Unit of Immigration, New Zealand. And from Vancouver, Canada, Baldwin Wong, Social Planner with the City of Vancouver. Now, Please join me in welcoming our first presenter from Wellington. It is my pleasure to invite Judy Altinkaya to share her experiences of the Wellington Marae Welcome Program, a program that connects newcomers to New Zealand's Maori culture as an essential dimension of contemporary New Zealand society. Welcome, Judy. The podium is yours. Thank you, Kim. Uh, and wel welcome everybody who's uh, joined us for this webinar. I would like to begin our session today uh, acknowledging an important Māori whakatauki. He aha te mea nui o te ao. He tangata, he tangata, he tangata. This saying is particularly relevant to our topic today as it goes directly to the heart of what immigrant receiving nations integration or settlement programs are all about. Different peoples connecting. The Wellington region that's engaged in the delivering the settlement activity that I'm speaking about today hosts New Zealand's capital city, Wellington, along with four other cities, Upper Hutt, Lower Hutt, Korirua, and Kapiti Coast. These are five quite distinctive cities that cluster along the edges of rugged hills that have been formed from many millions of years of seismic activity. When I wrote this webinar, we hadn't at that stage had our latest reminder of our seismic activity. And I'm pleased to report to everyone that although we've had a significant earthquake here, there has been minimal damage. So the Wellington region attracts highly skilled migrants to its film industry, to its civil service, to IT, health and technology sectors. There are seven goals to the Wellington Regional Settlement Strategy, a strategy that combines central and local government and non-government organisations in joint action to improve settlement or integration. The first goal of the Wellington Regional Settlement Strategy reflects the importance of welcoming new migrants and the importance of respecting cultural differences. Interestingly, the consultations with new migrants that underpins the development of the Wellington Regional Settlement Strategy highlighted a key gap for migrants. Prior to arriving in New Zealand, migrants have generally done a little bit of research about our bicultural nation. Once here in New Zealand, they are disappointed to realise that it's actually really difficult to connect with Māori. And for many migrants, this was a disappointment. On the other hand, Māori, who have a strong tradition of welcoming in their culture, had no clear way to connect with the newcomers arriving in communities. There were some very clear points that emerged from the strategy consultations uh, that local Māori wanted to discuss with migrants. Our region is surrounded by beautiful rocky coastline where new migrants found rich pickings for their dinner tables. They were ignorant of local cultural practice that sustains traditional food sources. So there were points to connect about. 
Immigration New Zealand holds the central government role of leading the implementation of settlement strategies, both the national settlement strategy and regional settlement strategies. And we sought funding for connecting Māori for newcomers from a pool of migrant levy funds that are dedicated to supporting settlement activity. We secured 15,000 per local authority per year over three years. So that was a total of 75,000 New Zealand dollars that we secured each year to implement our good idea. Local council staff worked with local iwi or tribes to develop proposals for the three years. Local council staff also took responsibility for reporting on the activities and for publicising the events to newcomers through their settlement support initiatives and staff. However, the, the path was not always easy for council and iwi. Uh, some of the councils and iwi did not have close relationships. And the achievement of this idea was made possible also through the important assistance of our own Immigration New Zealand's principal Māori advisor. Hundreds of newcomers to the region have been welcomed as manuhiri, or guests, to marae. Marae are meeting places for Māori. And, um, and they've been welcomed into the local community by the local iwi, or tribe. Uh, activities over the past few years have included pōwhiri, or welcome ceremonies, workshops about Māori tikanga, their history and cultural practices, food gathering and preparation, and waiata, or songs. So the activities have generally been a full day of a program that newcomers to the region are invited to um, participate in. The Marae is a special place. It's the courtyard in front of the Iwi's building in the local area. This is where the formal welcome ceremonies take place and we have a photograph of one here at Oronga Mai Marae. The opportunity for hundreds of new migrants to engage directly with Māori, to learn about their history and their culture, was unique. In fact, many New Zealand-born uh, residents don't easily get this opportunity. There was really active participation required from the new, new migrants. And I think it's this participatory learning that's a strong component of the programs that made a really lasting impression on the people who had taken part in the programs. So it wasn't simply a, a listening exercise. From the beginning, from the welcome onto the marae, participants were actually learning and doing. The engagement between Māori and the newcomers resulted in the discovery of many similarities between cultures. In fact, cultures uh, had similar attitudes to land or similar histories of losing their land to colonial powers. So there was quite a lot of synergy discovered between the peoples as they connected. The engagement also brought opportunity. Some of the iwi formed strong relations with migrant groups, and this has opened doors to possibilities for international business deals. A number of the iwi in New Zealand have had settlements from the government for past grievances. So they have a lot of money to invest. And this was an interesting and un unanticipated outcome, you could say. I mean, there were some strategy stakeholders who initially considered that the benefits of these activities might just flow one way to the newcomer migrants. In fact, nothing could have been further from the truth. Local Māori really appreciated the opportunity to get to know their new neighbours and to learn about their experiences uh, of coming here. 
nothing could really speak louder than the words of the people who were involved. And I have two examples, one from a migrant from Hungary and one from the Honourable Mahara Okiroa, who is an elder and was a member of parliament. The feedback from both newcomers and Māori participants has in fact been overwhelmingly positive. And I think we see in Mahara Okiroa's comment here that they probably wished that they could have done this a long time ago. Uh, and, and today the opportunity is there now for local iwi to engage with Māori, uh, sorry, with newcomers. And I'm really pleased to report that while the funding for this activity is now completed, we've had our three year program, the activity continues. And local government continues to work with iwi to welcome newcomers in their region. What I'm showing here today is a new resource, Tangata Whenua Ki Kapiti, the people of the land at Kapiti. The Kapiti District Council and Te Whakamananga, which is a local government partnership representing a number of local iwi in the Kapiti District, published this resource in time to launch it on Waitangi Day, a national day in New Zealand on February the 6th this year, 2013. It contains information about the local Māori culture and history, about the complexity of the iwi in the region, and it's aimed at new migrants in the area. This resource is available as a PDF and I have passed it on to Cities of Migration. It's a really good model for other areas to follow as well. An initiative such as this really does require a great deal of goodwill and patience from all the parties involved in promoting it and organising it. Because there are differences in expectations that have to be acknowledged and overcome. For example, it turned out, as I said earlier, that not all the councils were easily able to work with their local iwi. Um, and, and one of the programs in particular got off to a very shaky start and needed some outside elders to broker the situation. I will say, however, central government could not have achieved this action without local government uh, collaboration and connection. The initiatives needed strong promotion through the municipalities and those uh, municipalities also contributed their community development staff and their settlement support New Zealand coordinators to direct newcomers to the program. So my final message here is be flexible about the program design because this will foster strong ownership. Marae representatives had the flexibility to tailor the content and the type of their program to reflect the needs and perspectives of their local iwi. Um, so as a result, Marae members took strong ownership of the creation and delivery of the program and I think that's why they continue to, uh, with the programs. They see value in it and they have a strong ownership. Part of the relationship building is sharing the dialogue and the experience and the Marae and local government partners from across the region attended a regional hui or meeting uh, to report on the programs they had developed and to share their success stories. I'll leave you with an image of the connecting that is the outcome of this program. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Judy, for sharing that um, wonderful presentation and that magnificent image that we've got on screen right now. Um, we have much to learn from your success. Uh, uh, that was fantastic. So from one city to the next, we're now going to shift to Vancouver, Canada. I'm delighted to introduce Baldwin Wong um, to tell us about Vancouver's groundbreaking Dialogues project, an initiative launched by the local government in collaboration with community partners to help build stronger ties between Indigenous and immigrant communities within the city of Vancouver. Welcome, Baldwin. Thank you, Kim, and thank you to the Maytree Foundation for hosting this um, 
uh, webinar and choosing the Vancouver Dialogues Project uh, as a successful city initiative. Uh, and wonderful to hear from Judy about New Zealand too. Uh, we have much to learn from. Uh, so I would like to begin my presentation today. Um, Vancouver, the city of Vancouver is situated on the west coast of Canada and is the eighth largest city in Canada and the third largest metropolitan area in Canada too. The 2000, uh, 2011 census show that our city has a population of uh, about close to uh, over a little bit over 600,000. Uh, immigrants, those who are born outside of Canada, uh, constituted 44% of our total population. Vancouver also has a very significant urban Aboriginal population and is home to diverse Aboriginal peoples from across our province of British Columbia and Canada. Vancouver is also on the traditional territory of three Coast Salish First Nations, namely the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish Nations. Though Vancouver is demographically diverse, the city's Aboriginal and immigrant communities have few avenues to engage with each other. In 2008, the Mayor's Working Group on Immigration recommended that the city's efforts in welcoming newcomers should be done in the context of valuing and honoring the role of First Nations as the initial occupants of the land. The Dialogues Project was launched in 2010 with the goal of increasing understanding and strengthening relations between Aboriginal and immigrant communities in Vancouver. The project would provide opportunities to educate newcomers about First Nations and for the communities to engage in meaningful dialogue. Convened by the city, the collaborative project was supported by 27 key community partners and has three co-chairs, representatives from our local First Nation, from local urban Aboriginal organization, and from the immigrant community. The project's main funding was provided by the province of British Columbia through the Immigration Integration Branch. It started in January of 2010 as an 18-month demonstration project, but funding was extended, so in the end, the project continued until March of this year, which makes it to be a total of three years and three months long project. Three key approaches were used in framing the initiative. One, appreciative inquiry. We believe on focusing on people's positive experiences. Second, it will be a dialogic process, meaning people will be talking to each other. And thirdly, is storytelling. We believe in the importance of hearing the voices of people who are not often heard. There are five key initiatives, which will be described in more details later. One, dialogue circles. Two, community research. Three, culture exchange visits. Four, youth and elders. And fifth, storytelling project. In addition, the project hosted two celebratory events and was documented in various ways. This photo showed the launch of the project at the University of British Columbia First Nations House of Learning in April of 2010. Key initiative number one is Dialogue Circles. Dialogue Circles are facilitated groups of up to 15 people of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal backgrounds to come together to share their stories and aspirations as members of the community. These circles are safe spaces to encourage open and intimate sharing. Twelve such dialogue circles were established with a total of 120 participants. An interesting quote from one of the circle uh, participants, stories build community and create understanding. They are the memories and oral histories of people who have taken different journeys to create a home in Vancouver. More quotes from the dialogue circle participants. Uh, one on learning, they are very significant examples of the level of discussion. Uh, I remember when I was a very new immigrant, I hadn't seen any Aboriginal people before. I didn't know them. It was a new place. When I studied at university, my impression was that they had a very unhappy history. Someone also commented on racism. My journey has been about unlearning, unlearning whiteness and white privilege, unlearning self-hate, as an immigrant, as a black young girl, as a woman, I'm learning the history of this land. And finally, on land and belonging, many people who have had atrocities against them have been able to leave, recover, and return to reclaim the heritage and history. We have not had this chance. 
The Dialogues Project was supported by the Right Honourable Adrian Clarkson, former Governor General of Canada. Her support gave the project a very strong national profile and aroused interest from other parts of the country beyond Vancouver. Key initiative number two is community research. We did an online survey with more than 500 responses and we undertook a literature review and not surprisingly, there was not much materials regarding understanding the histories and cultures of First Nations here written for newcomers. We put together a dialogue book, which is uh, available online, and in the book we interview people from uh, the communities. Their honest sharing was both insightful and very moving. With funding from the Dialogues Project, the Federal Government Urban Aboriginal Strategy and Vancouver Foundation, we commissioned a report from the National Environics Project on Urban Aboriginal People's Study. And that gave us a lot of uh, excellent data and information. Finally, I want to uh, speak to the community research in terms of some highlights of the uh, online survey. Uh, from the survey, for example, 85% of people think that Vancouver is the generally welcoming city to all. 73% think that Vancouver is a welcoming city towards immigrants. And 39% think that Vancouver is welcoming towards Aboriginal people. The key second initiative, a uh, third initiative is cultural exchanges. Between September 2010 and November 2012, the project organized 15 cultural exchanges. Each of this visit was co-hosted by a local community partner and organization. About 700 people participated in these exchanges. Key elements for the visits included welcome by the host, guided tour of the site, presentations and speakers from the community, and very importantly, food sharing. Based on experience of these visits, community members have now initiated, initiated their own planning and visits as well. The project also summarized the various experiences in the planning into a brief guide to cultural exchange, which is available online. Here's a photo showing the cooking exchange between Afghani and Aboriginal women's groups. The sharing of recipes and eating together facilitated neighbors getting to know each other and also for future exchanges. In the winter of 2010, Flavor Tooth Nation powerfully shared with 70 visitors the history, the culture, and the current economic initiatives. In January of 2011, 50 people, including prominent First Nations leaders, visited with the Ismaili Council of BC. The sharing between communities was profound and moving. The stories of persecution, of seeking refuge, and the shared interests for building stronger relationships. In May of 2011, 80 people visited the immigrant serving, serving organization called Success in Vancouver, which is located in the heart of Vancouver Chinatown. The gathering highlighted the historic relationships between Chinese Canadian and First Nations, and participants shared current perceptions and commitment to form new relationships. Key initiative four is youth and elders. One exciting initiative we undertook was the Photo Voice project. Elders and youth were invited to work in small teams, had discussions, and then were provided with a quick course in Photography 101. They then went out to capture images that reflected the group discussion. Later on, these images, paired with text or explanations, were publicly displayed. This installation project highlighted the potential of intergeneration working together. Key initiative number five, story gathering project. This project aligned well with the interest of the Dialogues Project to collect personal stories from the community. In-depth interviews were conducted with a number of people, half of them Aboriginal and the other half non-Aboriginal. We asked participants to share their perceptions and perspectives of communities and how they wish communities can be working together in stronger ways. The stories were collected into one single volume called Our Roots. In 2012, the project's major focus was on youth. Through extensive social media outreach and engagement strategies, a two and a half day summit was planned with 120 youth attending. 28 workshops were offered during the course of that. 
The interest among youth participants was exceptional. The summit encouraged and promoted the building of community alliances, particularly um, among youth groups. The event was also video documented. The Dialogues project officially wrapped up in March of this year. While this slide shows some of the more explicit outcomes, so I won't repeat them, I would like to add that the project accomplishes some of the following. One, the project is an innovative project which is conducted at a citywide level. Two, many new and strong relationships were formed among communities. Three, communities gain confidence to interact and learn from each other. Four, project participants gain direct experiences to engage with each other. And fifth, it demonstrates the city's commitment to take on leadership to foster inclusive communities for all. There are significant ongoing initiatives within the city government and in the community which continue to build stronger relations between First Nations and communities at large. In 2011, City Council adopted a First Nations and Urban Aboriginal Communities Engagement Strategy which will continue to inform the work of the city. Over the past two years, our local First Nation has twice hosted citizenship ceremonies for new Canadians on their reserve. And I believe that's a groundbreaking uh, event in Canada. Vancouver's our local school board, a project partner, has sponsored joint events with local First Nations with the purpose of introducing immigrant students to First, Nation, First Nations history, culture, and interests. And currently, the city's welcoming communities project will be publishing, just like in New Zealand, what was mentioned, a newcomer's guide to Aboriginal communities. That book will be launched in, uh, early next year. And finally, our city council has recently proclaimed for the city of Vancouver a year of reconciliation, which starts from June of this year, 2013, to June of 2014 of next year. And significant interests from the city continue to support this reconciliation work. And that concludes my um, presentation. Oh, well, thank you, Baldwin, for, for, for showing us what, what city leadership and community partnerships mm -hmm. can achieve, and congratulations on yeah on the 2014 uh, Year of Reconciliation. I think you've contributed a great deal to that moving forward. Um, thank you very much, Baldwin and Judy. I hope everyone in our audience has learned as much as I have from these innovative projects and their powerful messages of welcome and, and belonging. You, you know what we say, good ideas travel. Um, so you'll notice that there is a new poll on your screen uh, we'd like you to, to uh, respond to that poll. We want you to let us know if you would adapt today's good ideas in your own city. You can cast your vote any time before the session ends. Um, the poll will be sitting there. It's completely confidential. Um, but uh, we'd really like to hear what you've got to say. So we've, we've now concluded the formal presentation part of our webinar. Um, it's time for our question and answer period. Um, that's where you, our audience, get an opportunity to ask questions to our um, wonderful presenters today. But before we get started, I will, I'll kick off the session with um, um, a few questions uh, for Judy and Baldwin. And while I'm doing that, you can continue to submit questions to the Q&A box. Um, so to, to start our Q&A then, you know, we've been talking about newcomers and First Nations people, um, people at opposite ends of the spectrum, the oldest uh, communities and the newest communities. Um, so I wonder whether um, both of you can comment on how inclusion is different from integration. And perhaps I'll start with you, Judy. Thank you, Kim. Um, and I just want to say, Baldwin, that was a fascinating presentation. And Thank what you. struck me was the similarities and the, yes. and, the, and the great extent you've gone to in Vancouver. Because here we had a project aimed at just connecting newcomers. And you've taken it so much more um, broadly to existing communities, such as in Chinatown. Um, I, I just think that's wonderful and great food for thought for organisations here in New Zealand. Um, so inclusion, different from integration? I don't think it is different from integration, 
uh, Kim. I think inclusion is a key component of good integration. So w we have a New Zealand settlement strategy that has a vision that says New Zealand's prosperity is underpinned by an inclusive society uh, in which the national and local integration of newcomers is supported by responsive services, a welcoming environment, and a shared respect for diversity. So we see inclusion as a, an ingredient, I guess you could say, of good integration outcomes. That's great. And obviously it's a good mix. It's a good recipe. Um, how about you, Baldwin? Do you see a difference? Oh. Or would you like to comment um, on sure. um, how inclusion I, is different or related to right. integration? I think in, in Canada, uh, particularly in the immigration field, um, the language was slightly different from the older discourse around assimilation, which is used you know, rather uh, quite a lot in the past. And I think we strong, more strongly believe that uh, integration is the pathway to, uh, for newcomers to be more adapted and more well settled in their um, you know, new communities in terms of integrating. And it still needs to be a two-way street in terms of ba based on and, and built on respect and honoring each other's um, uh, cultures and, and, and the perspective. Um, and that's kind of interesting. I think integration is still sort of um, evolving I even in that sense. I find inclusion probably an even broader concept, which means that we, um, we really believe society needs to be inclusive of everyone, regardless of their you know, race, gender, whatever you know, the particular circumstances to be. And I think um, they, they, while they're not exclusive of each other, I find inclusion is, is probably a more uh, important concept, for, particularly for the Dialogues project. Very good. Um, next question that I'd like to ask both of you um, is about storytelling. That's a very important part of both of today's projects. So I'd like, perhaps you could talk for a moment about why storytelling is so powerful and why it's so important to share your stories, um, not with families and with children at school. And maybe Baldwin, we could ask you to go first. Okay. Well, I mentioned one of the three um, approaches we used in framing the whole project is actually one is actually storytelling. And for the very simple reason that many of the groups, including both First Nations and newcomers, I mean, very often their stories are not heard um, by what we call mainstream community. Right. And I think the storytelling part is really to tell what we need to hear <laughs> from everyone. And mm. they're also very personal and direct and engaging. So in so many ways that we, um, in the three years that we're working on the project, we really strongly believe in, in gathering these stories from the communities. And they also become a legacy, you know, for those who have not been able to participate at the moment, but to learn from, the, from this process. Very good. How about you, Judy, about storytelling? I think uh, Baldwin's described a great formalization of um, of a process that I know happened in the Marae Welcomes, but wasn't one that we captured, but certainly sharing stories of cultural journeys, um, indigenous cultures and new cultures, was a key factor of um, the success of connecting. So it's, um, it's a really good project to probably pick up here and formalize the sharing of those stories for, as you say, Baldwin, for the future. Great. So um, we talk here in Canada um, and in New Zealand, we talk a great deal about immigration, you know, that voyage that people take to come to our countries. Yet what we know is that most of the world's migrants are internal migrants, often traveling within countries where many cu cultures, languages, um, religions already coexist or, or not. Um, what is true is that almost all migrants, wherever they are, um, are moving to cities. The process of urbanization is, uh, is a truly a 21st century global phenomenon. Um, and the shared experience of migrants is increasingly an urban experience. So I'd like to ask both of you what we can do to make urban culture more open and receptive to newcomers. Uh, and Judy, maybe we'll go to you. Sure, and yes, most migrants in New Zealand are in our, in our cities, 
um, although we do have special programs for, for rural areas. Um, in, the, in our cities, there is a, um, a great interest in, in being welcoming and inclusive, and generally uh, attempts are being made to open up events such as neighbourhood days, those getting to know your neighbour days, uh, to uh, new migrants and through the organisations that work with migrants. So in the past, you may have had a civic celebration that everyone was invited to. Uh, now it is recognised that some people need more than a general invitation. They need to be reached, really, through agencies and organisations that work with migrants. And I'd say it's not only the community, you know, in our urban areas. Uh, things like business awards for, you know, employers, good employers of migrants um, is, is, a, is a way of perhaps um, getting, getting more receptiveness, more understanding of the importance of being receptive to newcomers because it's not simply about the community engagement, it's also about um, engagement in the workplace, which is where most migrants come to be. So that's, that's a brief response there, Kim. Very good. Getting them into the mainstream. No, that's, that's excellent. How about you, Baldwin? How can we make oh. urban culture more open and receptive to newcomers? Well, I'm totally agreeing with Judy's uh, points. Um, I think for newcomers, I mean, we're looking at very globalized citizenry now, people moving from countries to countries, but many, you know, really come with lots of experiences and and skills and, and you know, how they can contribute. But locally, I mean, there's still um, local particular barriers in terms of sometimes it's language, sometimes it's just knowledge of um, how it works locally. So I think sometimes we, you know, whether it's government or community, need to just pay more attention to removing some of those barriers in terms of access and giving the right kind of support for newcomers in the settlement. And I'm so glad to hear like New Zealand and countries, uh, Canada, we are really providing um, you know, good support in that area. Um, then I think we need to kind of move further you know, along the, the, you know, those pathways in terms of beyond just uh, assisting and, and adapting, then really recognizing that, um, and it's actually a really interesting point, which is not only newcomers, we in Canada, many of our First Nations people actually come from other parts of the country into cities. So they almost in some way also newcomers to cities too. So the, the role that um, whether it's government or community need to play in terms of recognizing um, people, how people settle is very important. And also recognizing they have a role to and, and a way to contribute to the urban building. Uh, and to celebrate everyone's um, contribution. And, and I think Judy touched on really important points such as in the workplace, in employment, in the economy as well. Very good. Um, thank you very much, both of you. We're going to open up the floor to our audience now. I've got a number of really great questions. Um, the first one is from Fikir Zerai Mengistu. Um, and he asks, how does the city of Vancouver plan to continue this dialogue um, and how will the project be sustainable? But this is a question I think that applies equally um, to Auckland and Vancouver. But we will ask Baldwin Yu to comment on how you plan to continue your work. Okay. Well, um, very excellent question. And really right from the beginning, we are already thinking in terms of sustainability for such a, a project. And um, quite fortunately, we are now um, moving on to some other uh, projects which also allow for the same kind of capacity building and uh, dialogue work that can occur at the local level um, and it's actually uh, to continue to be supported by senior levels of government. Um, very interesting, we expand the notion of integration of newcomers to include relationship building with our First Nations communities and that seems to be uh, something that um, governments now, you know, seem to, to agree with and, and accept that as a uh, part of the integration process. So I think we're very hopeful that, and also we have very strong commitment from our city council. So as I mentioned, that this year our city council has made a proclamation for the city to, to have a whole year of reconciliation. And out of that, we, we actually set up um, a city staff interdepartmental team to really look at diff different ways of engaging with the community. And I think the work will continue in, in just in different forms. 
Very good. How about you, Judy? I think I'd agree with Baldwin and say that um, building commitment from the city, this, in the cities, is, to these sorts of initiatives is, is important. But as I noted in my presentation, you know, the government money ceased, but the programs continued at the at the level of engagement on the marae. And so that that was a, a you know a very um, probably not surprising, but uh, uh, if you understand Maori, but but it was you know enlightening to see that people who picked up a good idea saw the point in carrying it on. Uh, but as, as Baldwin says, it's about building the commitment in the civic areas. And I would like to say that since the development of the Wellington Regional Settlement Strategy and in fact the Auckland uh, Regional Settlement Strategy, their own economic development planning now includes sections entirely about newcomers, whereas when these strategies commenced about 10 years ago, um, they, they didn't have anything like that in their civic planning. So, so things take time. Yeah. That's quite changing hearts and minds, as, um, as our American friends like to say. Well, I think that success is probably the best um, measure of your uh, best predictor of sustainability. Um, I have a wonderful question here from uh, a technical question from Rachel Steinhardt, who is with Welcoming America in the US. She, she says, wonderful initiatives. What strategies have the speakers used to measure the impact of their dialogue work? Um, perhaps we can go back to you, Judy, about measuring sure. outcomes. Um, in terms of um, measuring outcomes in this kind of work, uh, perhaps, perhaps Baldwin would know a bit more than me about it, but, but we find it very difficult to measure outcomes beyond the tangible observations of people who are engaged in the program. Um, if we can look at our race relations um, track record, we have an entire agency devoted to, to looking at that. But, but with all our settlement activity, we generally measure the outcomes through a, what we call a settlement knowledge base, which is a, a, a research tool that takes in um, and measures outcomes of existing surveys. So there's, there's a number of surveys in New Zealand, New Zealand that, that measure you know, how people feel about others, if they feel part of their local community, belonging, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So in terms of measuring this particular project, our measures didn't go beyond the, the discussions and dialogues and reports that we had from participants. Mm -hmm. that's, that, that's the next Thank you, Judy. And Baldwin, how about you? Um, um, yeah, I, I really agree with Judy's uh, uh, comments. Um, from the dialogue side, we, uh, we, we were required, actually, by, as part of the project, to document and to uh, do, um, uh, actually, we have a third-party evaluation uh, team to help us better understand the outcomes. Um, so we, you know, in some way, we have some sense of, uh, from program participants, whether they are satisfied with, you know, um, their, particip their participation, whether they gain new knowledge, uh, whether they would use the knowledge to apply to other things, we have a sense of that, and it's well documented in the various initiatives that we undertook. But having said that, the broader, uh, the broader kind of outcomes are harder to measure, which is like, you know, in terms of community alliance building and relationship uh, forming, those are harder to gauge. And, um, but having said that, I certainly have seen a lot of uh, uh, communities um, own emerging uh, initiatives and collaboration that are taking place that is really beyond the life of the project and, and we're very pleased to, to uh, uh, take note of that. Um, but this is always one of those challenges for a kind of community particip participatory type of project because that's not necessarily, um, you know, anything is quantitatively measurable. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much. I have a quick question for you, um, Baldwin, from Gloria Walsh, who asks mm -hmm. whether you can give us a rough idea of how much your uh, project cost over those three years. 
Uh, right. Um, the the project um, over three years cost uh, a little bit over six hundred thousand uh, dollars, but that is not really including uh, a huge amount of in-kind contributions, both from the city and from our community partners. So I would say if you add in all those time and in-kind and um, um, sponsorship and and really the t you know time invested. I think it will be closer to a million dollars <laughs> if one can say so. Um, but it's you know, but for um, project cost, it was it was about over a bit over six hundred thousand. Great, thank you. Worth every penny. So I have another question. This one from Hélène Pellerin in Ottawa for you, Judy. Um, Hélène asks: Are Aboriginal communities in New Zealand involved in any way in decision making regarding immigration levels and programs in the country? Very good question, Elaine. Um, I think the answer is no uh, in terms of immigration levels because those levels are set by the New Zealand government. So in as much as Aboriginal communities mm -hmm. and all communities have involvement in their government's decision making, um, that is the extent of engagement and involvement. In terms of programs around the country, there is more direct engagement in the settlement type programs or integration type programs, as you call them. And, and I've just given you one example. There are more um, around the country um, that we have involving local Aboriginal people. Okay, great. Now, now Baldwin, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, this mm -hmm. question is from Dust. Das Dirty um, from in Toronto at York University, and Das Dirty asks about um, your, the strategies that you use for approaching the Aboriginal community. Okay. What strategies did you right. use? Right. I think multi-prong. <laughs> um, well, actually, even for 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 the city, uh, we in be, before the project. While we have ongoing relationships with our local First Nations, um, they were, I don't think I couldn't describe them as particularly robust. So, um, so actually through this process, we, we actually have to, um, we have to take time to build the trust uh, with our local First Nations that it is worth their while as well in terms of investing their time and energy into working with us. Um, and we do have very good ongoing relationships with our urban Aboriginal organization partners. So those are the ones we approached in um, soliciting their support, and, uh, and we're happy that they, they were um, very reciprocal in, in, in giving us that support in the beginning and continue to do so. I think you really need to um, build on trust, um, and, and, um, and that's really important. Thank you. Um, I have a question now, uh, again, uh, from Eileen Omosa who says, hello, and thank you for the elaborate presentations. She asks a technical question. How do you separate and meet the needs of different groups within your work? Um, for example, different age groups, different ethnicities, different levels of education. That's a big question. So um, I think we'll look for just a, a, short, a short answer from, from each of you um, about different strategies you may have used to address um, those different groups different in the community. So Baldwin? Want to go first? Sure. Um, we pay particular attention to working with youth in the project. We actually hire youth community developers to work with us in the first two years, and the third year actually was entirely focused on working with youth. Uh, but along the way, we also um, really work quite quite rigorously with the elders in the community. So those are two age groups that we particularly we pay a lot of attention to, and um, yeah, and and they really require specific focus. How about you, Judy? We didn't um, separate out uh, different groups. Uh, uh, what happened on local marae in separating out groups uh, was up to the, the local Māori who were organising the program. So everyone is welcomed and, and, and generally everyone participates in activities together. We didn't, as Baldwin's project, have specific focuses on different um, ages or 
or different ethnic groups. It was a matter of engaging newcomers, whatever their ethnicity and background, with local Māori. Okay. Great, thank you. And of course, I have a, a couple of um, connected questions here. I think they're difficult questions, but important ones to address. Amy from Okazi here in, in, on, in Toronto asks, how did your programs deal with the misconceptions, the stereotypes, and some of the negativity that we know exists in the field? Um, Judy, do you want to start? I mean, these programs were all about that, that very factor, the misconceptions, the stereotypes, the negative media that migrants might have read. So before migrants come to New Zealand, they generally understand or know a little bit about Māori. Um, when they get here, they see uh, the stereotypes, the negativity. And the, the, the most important thing is for people to engage, dialogue, and understand. And, um, and so these sort of programs are exactly what you use to deal with misconceptions. And, and you, um, Baldwin? Uh, I think the same. How did the program same kind deal of response. with it's a, it's a complex question. That, um, yes, um, I think almost the entire project in some way is it's a public education project and, and really is to really um, correct a lot of misconceptions out there about really not just even the, the Aboriginal and First Nation side, but also about immigrants too. So the entire project, you know, is premised on the fact that we have to um, really uh, have a better understanding of people. And I think the storytelling part of it is, is so very powerful that um, we learn so much from people sharing their direct experience, not always come out in a negative way, but even in a positive story, you can learn a lot. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes. Um, a related question from Michael Kerr um, really asks, uh, examines um, lessons from history. He asks, has there been sharing and learning across common histories of racial exclusion and marginalization? For example, linking Watangi's treaty obligations, the poll tax, redress of Chinese, Kiwis, to the current experiences of prejudice, discrimination, and racism of Maori and people of color in, in our Turia? That's a big question, Judy, obviously, for you. But I think the, um, the question maybe for both Baldwin and Judy is, is, um, is can we learn lessons from our past to, um, uh, to help uh, the work that we want to do in the present? Absolutely, and I was just about to comment on Michael's question as well, Kim. That is a big question, Michael, uh, for a short time. But um, the lessons of the past are all about the learnings of the present. Um, Michael, if you're asking about formalizing those connections between different uh, incidences in our nation's past, I'm not certain that those have been formalized in any way. Uh, certainly not through the kind of programs that I'm engaged with. And in terms of current experiences, our work in settlement and in leading settlement is to mitigate uh, some of the very natural things that occur in all countries of the world in terms of prejudice, discrimination and racism. Um, and and I, I, I think that that's an ongoing challenge for us. And, and Baldwin, do you want to comment on that question? Yeah, just briefly. Um, just sort of reflecting, for example, last year when we held the Youth Summit, um, in fact, I, I think the youth, what we learned from the summit was that the youth who came forward really, really, really understand the, um, the importance of uh, anti-racism, anti-exclusion um, um, strategies could and should be. Uh, in, in addressing these kind of um, relationship building process. Um, so we learn a lot from that and many of the workshops offered were freely from uh, practitioners themselves who, you know, very, very experienced uh, in terms of addressing these type of issues. So I think this is sort of all embedded into the process. Thank you very much. Now, um, we're, we're in the last five minutes. I've got a lot of questions. A couple more questions on evaluation. Um, people are interested in knowing whether the um, uh, attitudes of, of the Aboriginal groups had 
changed as a result of um, their experience? Was that measured? Was one uh, question that I have here from Carmen Larson in Vancouver. Um, Bolton, can you answer that question? Uh, sorry, can you? So the question is uh, outcomes. Yeah, we, whether there was um, whether you've attempted to measure um, new. We talked a little about newcomer perceptions. Says Carmen, she asks whether yeah. um, whether Aboriginal people's perceptions of newcomers um, mm -hmm. were measured before and after these projects. Uh, we did the same evaluation with everyone who participated in the initiatives. So, uh, and we do have uh, more specific breakdown numbers in terms of how people responded to this type of question. Um, but generally speaking, the, the number of uh, Aboriginal participants is um, less, less than uh, non-Aboriginal. So mm -hmm. I don't know whether I can you know, kind of make a case that, you know, uh, and to what extent that Aboriginal uh, people um, feel that they have, you know, moved forward on on the perceptions or understanding or not. But uh, but in terms of community collaborative projects now, I certainly observe that there are many uh, more uh, that happen between uh, immigrant and Aboriginal organizations uh, as a result of the process. So um, I'm heartened by that. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, and how about you, Judy? Are you are you seeing similar trends in New Zealand? Yeah, as I, as I said earlier, we didn't formally measure outcomes for these engagements, but I certainly know that anecdote from Māori um, participants as well, and there were lots of Māori engaged in these projects. They certainly weren't aware themselves of of the histories and the stories of people who have come to live here. Yeah. No, I think that's very interesting. It's a very interesting place to end our conversation today with a, 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 one last question from Magdalena, who writes, um, considering that both Canada and New Zealand are countries with histories of colonization, how do you see these types of projects? How could they be expanded to teach not only newcomers, but the, but the wider society? Um, and I think that's a terrific question. I mean, how can... Um, all Canadians, all um, all New Zealanders uh, learn, uh, make sure that we can learn something from the, the wonderful projects that mm -hmm. you, Baldwin, and you, Judy, are leading. How yeah, do you Jamie. share um, the success of your projects with the wider community? Yeah. Judy? Or Baldwin? Oh, well, we, uh, we tell cities of migration about it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, <laughs> Um, we 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 actually have uh, find that local newspapers featuring these activities has been probably the most powerful. Not the national newspapers, but the local community newspapers. And um, and I, I think that uh, in terms of the wider society, um, even even beyond the wider settler society, you know, it's just about creating opportunities for engagement, and that's that's the key. Uh, as far as we're concerned, it's, it's really opening the doors, um, and Māori have stepped up to that, and uh, and and it, it is a challenge to to broaden that, uh, but um, it's certainly one that uh, good promotion should engender. Uh, great. How about you, Baldwin? How are we going to yeah. share um, this wonderful work well, with the wider community? It, it is uh, a really excellent question. And in fact, when we um, named the project, um, you know, we're actually with three um, kind of constituency or groups, you know, as you may call them, First Nations, uh, urban Aboriginal and immigrant communities. Um, we actually use very broad, um, kind of a very broad approach to, to naming those communities. So by immigrants, actually, we, we would have meant, <laughs> we have meant everybody except for the First Nations, <laughs> because we assume that everyone comes from somewhere else, <laughs> even from the very beginning. And, um, and the reason why we, do, we did distinguish urban Aboriginal is to recognize um, uh, First Nation people who are coming from other parts of the country or from the province. And the First Nations, we generally refer to the local First Nations. And that's why you know the distinction, but really immigrants um, would cons I would, would consider everybody to be part of the immigrant community other than the First Nations. Very good. 
Well, I think we've come we've come to the end of our uh, Q and A, and and I'd like to close by asking Baldwin and Judy um, one final short fire question. Um, one word from each of you will do, um, and that is, what is the one most important secret to your success? If you had to put it in one word or two, what would that? Mm -hmm. be? Judy, how about you? Passion. Passion, great. And Baldwin. Commitment. Excellent. Well, I, I want to thank you, Judy, um, from uh, from Wellington, and uh, Baldwin from Vancouver for sharing these uh, wonderful projects with us. I'd like to thank the audience. Um, the audience joins me, I'm sure, in thanking you. Our time has now run out. Um, and so on behalf of all of our participants, and Maitri, we want to thank uh, you, Judy, Alting Kaya from the Settlement Unit Immigration in New Zealand, and Baldwin Wong from the City of Vancouver. Um, I'd like everyone to imagine this excellent work being interpreted in your city, or adapted by your organization, or being used to change uh, your neighborhood. We'd like to hear your stories and share more good practice, so please stay connected. <laughs>